My name is Bill Lutz. I am the director of Gingsburg's Outreach Center, which is called New Path. We help people, whether it's food, clothing, home goods, transportation, medical needs. We help people, that's what we do. A friend asked me, New Path does so much good, but which New Path service are you most passionate about? Without a doubt, I'm most passionate about the New Path Utility Assistance Program. Each month, without fail, families come into New Path asking for help paying their utility bills. Normally, we have to turn most of these families away. However, in June, we received additional funds from the United Way, and since then, we've been able to help every family that has come to us. The poverty rate in Miami County, which is where Ginghamsburg Tip City Campus is located, is 7.9%. That's over 8,000 people that don't have the necessary income to afford a basic standard of living. The pandemic of 2020 has only increased the number of families facing tough choices. Choices like keeping the power on or buying food for their family. Specifically in Piqua, where electricity, water, and sewer are all on one bill, many families have bills that are higher than their rent or mortgage. That puts approximately 1,100 families at risk and accumulates to over a million dollars in missed utility payments. Think of what might happen without essential utilities in your own home. Basic daily necessities like cooking, refrigeration, hygiene, and heat through the winter would all present significant challenges. If we want to make sure no kid goes to bed without faith, family, and food, we need to make sure they have clean water and electricity to cook. These families need help, and we're going to give it to them, because that's what we do. This year's Christmas Miracle Offering is going to expand the New Path Utility Assistance Program by 400 families. Not only that, but we can provide each family with financial counseling to ensure greater financial health and eventually financial freedom. But of course, none of this happens without you. Give the gift of hope this Christmas. It's for the kids. Hi everyone, I'm Pastor Rachel. Merry, merry, merry Christmas. I've already talked to several of you who've made the incredible sacrifice to give half of your Christmas spending to this year's Christmas Miracle Offering. Together, we'll be able to expand New Path's utility assistance program by 400 families. Friends, that makes God smile. If you want to see this dream become a reality, it's not too late to give. You can help a family turn the lights back on by making a gift at ginghamsburg.org give or by texting GCGIFT to 77977. That's GCGIFT to 77977. There's no greater gift than the gift of hope.
believe that the new year is already upon us? 2020 is the fastest, lowest year I think we've ever experienced. One traumatic event after another has us staring at a new year wondering, where do we start? January resolutions barely seem possible with much of life beyond our control. But what if? What if all we needed is a different perspective? We could start small, reclaim what we can, put our stake into one relationship, one act of kindness, one purposeful step at a time. We're gonna start the new year by diving into Paul's New Testament letter to the Ephesians. And we're gonna get our lives back. Here's a quick look at the new series starting in January.
Who will you invite to join you? Follow Ginghamsburg on Facebook and YouTube for shareables that you can use to invite friends and family and coworkers. Up next is a beautiful word from the book of Luke chapter two. Grab your Bibles and a pen to take notes. God is whispering something just to you today. Hey church, before we get started today, let me say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you all. It has been a long year with plenty of distractions and blessings, but let me tell you what I've been reflecting on lately. 
Lately, I've been thinking about what is the measure of a life well spent? How do you know whether you're wasting your life or investing it in things that really matter? In America, we have several yardsticks by which we measure a life. We feel that if a person does something useful for society, whether it's a profession or a trade, he or she spends his or her life well. Another yardstick we use is busyness or sheer activity. Our lifestyles reflect our values here. We're all extremely busy people, our weekly calendars are filled to the brim, and we have the notion that if you slow down for just even a minute, you're wasting your life. We also gauge our lives by adventure and excitement. And if you can't get that firsthand, we pick it up vicariously on television or at sporting events. Our heroes lead these exciting lives and we read social media posts that tell us about the rich and the famous, secretly wishing that our lives could be like theirs. We generally think that a person who dies rich and famous has achieved success. Now against these yardsticks of a life, of a life well spent, I want to introduce you to Anna. She shows up in the book of Luke, is described in three short verses, is not even quoted directly and is gone. If we were to meet a modern day Anna today, we would probably find her to be a bit different. As we will see, her values are clearly out of sync with those of modern times, but they are refreshing to us so that we can see what really matters in life. Anna's story is an invitation to simplify our lives and focus on what is really primary. For our scripture today, we're going to be coming from Luke chapter two, verses 36 through 40. And it reads, there was a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Now church, by today's standards, we might look at Anna's life and think, what a waste, 84 years, most of it spent in the temple fasting and praying. You have got to be kidding me. That's not the kind of life I wanna live. I'll grant that we are not all called to devote ourselves to a ministry of prayer and fasting. Obviously, God had gifted her in that way, and she lived accordingly. But apart from her unique gifts, the principle holds true. Anna lived fully devoted to God, and God looked on her with favor. She played her God-given role well, and her life was, in fact, well spent. But you still may be thinking, now, come on, didn't Anna really waste her life? You may not verbalize it, but you may be thinking, Religion has its proper place, but this is a bit extreme. God chose Anna to see the infant with her own eyes and to tell everyone that Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, her life was so well spent that it gives us a new yardstick to measure ours. And here is what this spiritual grandmother teaches us about devotion to God. Number one, devotion to God always involves worship, witness, and waiting. Worship, witness, and waiting. So worship. Some saints like Anna are especially gifted for the ministry of prayer and enabled her to devote large blocks of time to it. Part of that time involved interceding for others, but part of it was also devoted to praise and thanksgiving. The main thing in prayer though is to seek God and to commune with him. Anna's witness. Anna couldn't keep it to herself. She continued to speak of him to others. And if you're excited about your relationship with the living God who sent his son to save you from your sins, people around you should know about it. The reason, Anna, the reason Anna was telling everyone about the Lord was that she spent so much time in private devotion to the Lord. And then there's Anna's waiting. Anna was looking for the redemption of Jerusalem, referring to the spiritual redemption that God had long ago promised and now was bringing to fruition for his people by way of Jesus' birth. As I said early, a modern day Anna would look a little different by today's standards, but I had the pleasure of being raised by one. She was my grandmother. Her name was Willie Fleming. In fact, no one has modeled this pattern of devotion in my life better than my grandmother. She had her own version of this pattern, but her entire life revolved around church 
which is where she worshiped, her table, which is where she witnessed to all of us, and her prayer, which was her form of waiting. As I got older, I could see that my grandmother simplified her life by focusing on devotion to God and family. And as long as I've known her, I've never known her to have a job or to even drive, but she was the glue of our family by how she prayed, how she counseled, how she encouraged, how she corrected, and how she served at her table. My grandmother passed away in 1990, but not before teaching all of us how to lead lives of dedication to God and family. Being around my family is like heaven on earth, and that is because of the legacy of devotion my grandmother taught us. The second lesson that Anna teaches us about devotion to God is this. Devotion to God is available to everyone. No matter what your station in life, no matter what your color, no matter what your sex, no matter what your orientation, no matter what your financial situation may be, you can devote yourself to the Lord and that makes whatever you are and whatever you do count for God. Let's take Anna for example. Anna was a woman. While Jewish women enjoyed more respect in that day than women in other cultures, there was still a fair amount of discrimination towards them. And yet with all of this separatism going on, the Lord is pleased to include Anna's testimony concerning Jesus. You see, God is no respecter of persons and is pleased with the devotion of any person, male or female. Anna was a widow. In fact, she had been widowed at an early age. See, she easily could have grown bitter towards God and complained of her loneliness. While living a life devoted to God, she realized that God has a special concern for widows and she took refuge under God's protective care. You see, church, her trials drove her to deeper devotion to God. I said her trials drove her to deeper devotion to God. Anne was also elderly. While the elderly were more respected in that, so in that society than they are in ours, they were still subject to the abuse of the immoral and unethical in society at that time. Thankfully, God does not view our seniors as useless and a burden on society. In fact, if an elderly person is devoted to God, their life is precious in his sight. So we see that Anna had three strikes against her. She was a woman, she was a widow, and she was elderly. Now, if the truth be told, some of us have a few strikes against us as well. But during this Advent and Christmas season, the whole story of Jesus' birth is pointing us to see the good news that a life with God is available to us and no one is disqualified and no one is uninvited. So we have seen that devotion to God always involves worship, witness, and waiting, and that devotion to God is available to all, no matter what your station in life is. Despite Anna's strikes, she was focused and committed to something else. Anna reveals to us that devotion to God is really all that matters. Stop and think about it. What else matters in this life? The Pharisees and the, and the scribes thought that religious duties were what mattered. That was their yardstick. They scurried around the temple precincts that day performing rituals oblivious to this unique baby who was being dedicated to the Lord. It gave them a sense of pride to be able to say, all my life, I've kept the commandments of the Torah. But guess what? They missed the Messiah because they were really more devoted to themselves than to God. The Sadducees, they thought political power and influence were what mattered. That was their yardstick. Life after death, they scoffed, is just pie in the sky when you die. What matters is here and now. A group of them probably passed within yards of the child and Anna as they were on their way to one of their famous debates. The temple merchants thought that a good income is what mattered, and that was their yardstick. They hoarded their temple money, and they sold their sacrificial animals probably within earshot of the humble couple and their newborn son. They lived well and left a nice inheritance to their children when they died, but they missed God's Savior that day. In contrast to all these, Anna knew that devotion to God is all that matters. She recognized the child as God's promised Messiah, making her wiser than all the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Anna is challenging us today to simplify some things in our lives and to focus on what's really important. We can get so caught up in how our lives are supposed to look 
with all these yardsticks that we forget about what is primary. Both Anna and my grandmother made devotion to God their top desire, and they both lived lives well spent while waiting. I remember my grandmother's funeral, and it was so obvious that her life was spent pouring into her faith and pouring into her family's faith. It was a glorious day, and even though I miss her tremendously, I am forever blessed by watching and following my modern-day Anna. So church, what have you committed your life to, really? I'm asking that question because there is no better time than now, between 2020 and 2021, to get real about it. Do you have a focus that keeps you centered? Do you have spiritual practices that keep you falling in love with Jesus day after day after day? Anna invites us to make devotion to God our top priority, to simplify our lives as we look to the future. God bless you, church. Amen. Amen, Pastor Carl. Now is the time to focus on what matters most. Have a fun and safe conclusion to 2020, and we'll see you in 2021. The best is yet to come. Say